I remember you and I being so excited when this project started back in 1984. And I think that's around the time you and I first really got to know each other. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. I love being with you because every time I'm with you, I learn something that I didn't know. <laughs> but yeah, I think that we'd maybe met a little earlier than, than 84. But LA is my lady has a very special place in my heart. It really does because I have a personal connection to the L. At least I, from, my, from my perspective. But just being there for the session that, that I was there, is, uh, as you recall, Frank used to invite selected people from whatever to come and attend the session. And I was there for the Teach Me Tonight and How Do You Keep the Music Playing. And I, I forget the other one. The chance to be there with the great William B. Williams, who was on WNEW for years and very close with Frank. They were both friars together at the Friars Club in New York. And of course, William B. named Frank chairman of the board. And so just being there with Willie and then the, the orchestra and what have you was just a very special time. But those sessions were great because, as you know, Frank really didn't work in New York a lot. Right. Most of everything from Capitol, few reprise sessions were done in the late 60s in New York. And as you mentioned, I think Steve Ross was there. It was a who's who of people that were invited to this session. Quincy originally envisioned this as a deluxe package of three albums. It had started out in late 82 with Frank and Lena Horn, but for various reasons that didn't happen. And then it was going to be an album with Frank and Buddy Rich. And that fell apart months before what finally came to be L.A. is My Lady. I was lucky enough over the years to talk to Quincy about this album. He was so gracious. He gave me a lot of paperwork and uh, ephemeral from the album. And we put a lot of that in the new booklet. And here's Quincy discussing about how the album actually came about. It's been uh, well, almost 23 years since I've been working with Frank now. I'd like to count Mason, for example, Sam. Um, and over the years, you know, Frank often uh, honestly gets called and says, you, would you like to write an opener for my show? Or would we you know, you sit down and do an album? And this album has been just lurking over our heads, you know, for years. And we talked about doing an album with Nina. That didn't work out. And finally, he said, uh, we're going to do this album with Buddy Rich in New York. We started to make songs, and it turned out to be this album. Uh, but it's, it's, it's like one long preparation period, you know, it's been going on ongoing and ongoing for 15 years, you know, just warming up, just trying to, both of us trying to find an excuse to just hit that studio together. And uh, that, this is the, uh, the end result of that, uh, that energy all this year. Let's begin by hearing from Quincy Jones, Lionel Hampton, Phil Ramone, Marilyn and Alan Bergman, and the chairman of the board himself. I've done dates with Irving Green for 33 years, and Irving Green's played with everybody, and when he comes to the session with a, a camera in his trombone case to take a picture of that session, I know something special is going on because these guys go to sleep on everybody because they're that good. And uh, when I saw Irving's camera, it almost made me cry. I said, you know, I knew it was as special as everybody else felt it was. And that's uh, that's very rare that that happens, you know, regardless of what happens, to get that many people to come with that much experience and background to come ready to give up everything that they've trained themselves for their whole life for to put it on the line for this night, because it was important to put it on the line this night. So we're going to cut it so that it's all right. How many times have this? Well, about three times. Yeah, go through it. All right, sir. Right. Okay, I know we do. No problem. You know, you think this recording fest that we had was a special sought out um, invitation to the greatest. First, we had the greatest of all greats, Frank Sinatra, the singer. We had uh, Quincy Jones as a ranger for this great session. Take it 61 more time, please. We had side men such as Joy Benson, Ray Brown, and Joe Newman, and uh, Frank Foster. I could keep on name all of them. From the Lionel Hamptons to Jerome Richardson, and uh, here's the Young Brecker Brothers, and crossover of a lot of musicians from rock and roll and jazz. I learned uh, 23 years ago when working with Frank and, uh, and Count Basie that uh, it's a good idea to really have your homework done and have everything well planned because he's a perfectionist and uh, if we come in three hours early and get all the balances done, get all the notes straightened out and everything else. <laughs> That's the milk in there. One, two, two, two. Uh, <laughs>
At 181, I don't think you should catch all those accidents, man. I think you ought to just chop wood in there. Go ahead. You got the four by soul, and then you guys basically you're in base carrying the carrying the company to the forklift. Well, well, what was going on in the room before Frank arrived was the kind of tension you'd expect at Yankee Stadium before you go out in the World Series. I think somebody was thinking, yeah, we got two of right here. We got me being completely over the top trying to figure out how I'm going to get through this fears that I hadn't had in years. I think that somebody of that stature, that everybody respects so much, there's an electricity and a heat when he walks in the room. I don't think intimidating is the word, but I think there's a, there was a, definitely a current in that room. Hello, guys. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I'm going to say hello now. Because he doesn't like the circle of field too much, you know. He doesn't like to linger. He condenses his energy and puts it all together. And as a perfectionist, he goes for it at the moment. You might not get more than one or two takes. And so it's good that everybody's ready. Because if he goes and gets his, you know, he might start without you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, so I know exactly where the, the, the jump is in the, uh, in the phrase. If we take it from 41. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to lay out and get up on the top of the next. Okay, 41. Go. 541. One observation I've made over the years of working with Frank is that the one thing that transcends him being concerned about is the image as the greatest pop singer in the world, and he certainly is, is that, and I, this is what I love about him, is that he has his basic respect as far as his love for music and his roots, and his roots are really come from him being a big band singer. Try to hit me. I sing for you. I even punch out Mr. T. Yeah, I want to put the later note in there first. Yeah, yeah, that's I couldn't hear the picture together. There's a lot of funny points. Yeah. Da 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 da. Okay. A singer is really measured, uh, I suppose, by uh, equipment in three areas: uh, uh, intelligence, uh, vocal equipment, and emotional range. And certainly, he has all three in abundance and that's why he's one of the great interpreters and who makes your uh, both uh, your melody and your lyric sing that was until the real thing comes along by sammy khan and sal chaplin sammy actually wrote new lyrics for frank for this to sort of updated the lyrics on until the real thing comes along but there's a connection with this song in you uh, tell us i claim partial credit for having the song added to the album or included in the album because Frank Jr. Had, uh, had done a concert or done an engagement at the Capitol Hill Hyatt in Washington, D.C. And this was on the, on his, on his show list. And I just thought, Frank's never recorded it. It sounded great. I said, it, I'm sure it'd be something comfortable that he, he'd feel comfortable doing. And so I put it on a cassette, sent it to uh, Sarge Weiss and the Sinatra office, and I just said, hey, if, if you think it's, it's worth, you know, taking to Frank, I'd love love for you to do it. He did. I heard nothing back for weeks. <laughs> and then I got a call from Sinatra. Dorothy Yeoman called me and said, you know, the Mustaches is on the line. And he said, um, the other song I'd sent him was Pete Kelly's Blues, that Frankie had done a marvelous lyric to. And so Frank replied, said, listen, I love the, the lyric, but Sammy Kahn did the original for Pete Kelly's Blues, and there's no way that we're going to record that. He said, but until the real thing comes along, he says, I like it, and I think Quincy likes it, so we'll see. That's how I left it. And lo and behold, when the album came out, until the real thing was on the album. So, as I say, from my perspective, I'm taking partial <laughs> credit. That's okay. <laughs> but it could be you have... You know, you may have other information that, you know, that maybe was selected long before that I don't know. But No, uh, your story sounds really valid, and I, I'm sure Frank respected when anybody of that in that inner circle would recommend songs. Like I said, we were all so excited that he was going to do an album of standards. It was great, and I, I, that's one of my favorite tracks it's on the album. It's really good. 
It's a fun track. Here's Sammy Khan discussing the new lyrics. And so I went to the typewriter I'm sitting at, and it's a curious thing. I, I write special lyrics as easily as I breathe, maybe easier than I breathe at my age. <laughs> and I found it rather curiously uneasy to take these words that I've been living with all my life and try to change them for a record album because what I'm doing is changing them in a sense forever. So I, I usually go very glibly and easily, but all of a sudden I found myself kind of hesitating. But I finally wrote the two lyrics and sent them in. So I, I found it very, very curious. I wrote these two lyrics and sent them in an hour. I found myself in the middle of a huge, huge organization called Quincy Jones. And the most, most relentless kind of uh, organization. Uh, Ms. Khan, uh, this is Quincy Jones' office, and uh, we're waiting for the lyrics. I said, yes, I know, you'll have them. I said, Mr. Khan, we've got the lyrics. And so on, so on, and, and I got communiques, I got memos, I got timetable, I got schedules. I'm sure the landing at uh, D-Day on Omaha Beach didn't have as much preparation as with all these memos and things. It was just the most incredible. Uh, but I must say, I have here somewhere a note from Frank, which was very gracious. I'll show it to you if you want me to, in which he thanks me for the lyrics. You know, I've been banned in Boston many, many times. You know, the lyric to teach me tonight was actually banned in Boston. The one line at the end, one thing isn't very clear, my love, should the teacher stand so near, my love, graduations on this chair. That was banned in Boston. So I, I felt that I should get uh, even a little bit, so that's when I used the line about, you know, uh, I thought I knew the score of it, feel I should know more of it, off the wall, the bed, the floor of it, teach me tonight. I must tell you that when you're writing a, a lyric for a fellow like Sinatra, or a fellow like a Fred Astaire, that their name should be on the song. Don't tell them I said that. Their name should be on the song because you can hear their input. You can hear their input. And when you're dealing with Sinatra, you're dealing with another entity entirely. I'm not paying homage, I'm just giving you Facts. I always said when you buy a Sinatra record, any Sinatra record, it's like going to the music hall, going to the neighborhood movie house. Sinatra gave you the best arrangers you could buy, the best recording studio. You, you went top drawer in every instance, and everyone felt that. And Sinatra, I've seen Sinatra walk in and the arrangement wasn't quite. I've seen Sinatra have a fellow play an arrangement for an hour until he felt where it was he fit into the arrangement. Not too many men have either the power, the money, or the taste to do that. You talk about a man who had all those things and did them. Look, look at it's the difference, that's all. Viva la différence. It's the difference, that's all. You know what I mean. Once again, here's Phil Ramon, Quincy, the Bergmans, and Frank Sinatra. It was kind of like a whole all-star team, you know, just meeting in the room for the first time again. It, nobody records that way anymore. It's not quite the way we record. It's almost an endangered species today to have everyone come in the room at the same time, especially the singer and all the instruments and the rhythm section at the same time, because everything is done in such a modular fashion today, where you come in and you put a drum machine on first, and that takes all day. Then you put the bass and the guitar on next, and then the piano, and then the horns and the string, and then the, the, the solo vocalist, and then the background vocalist. And that can take three months, and nobody ever sees the other elements. Mm -hmm. It's so bad.
He's also adjustable. If he says, well, if that's where that figure is, I know what I'm going to do. You know, if the horns are going to come in a sudden flare and he's got to get around it or it's going to blast him out, he's musically there. He knows what he wants. And the mix is done. Yeah. Fun of it. Ray and Bob. You like a small club somewhere. And it's like a trio. I hear. I hear. It's the energy, but it's soft. I hear. You mean for the whole first part where it's soft? No, no, no. After the vocal comes in. Vocal comes in, yeah. Great, okay. Terrific, okay. So we got the brushes in there. Okay. Chips? Do you want to get like that, that, that tight simmering club feel? He suggests that intimacy to start off like we're going to deal with a trio and then have the big band just explode and just happen all of a sudden rather than you know, having a big band feel up front with the rhythm section, but have it come down just like it's an intimate nightclub scene and then explode when the band hits. Because that's that's very that's dramatic and it's very theatrical. Roll the tape. Writing for Sinatra is like writing for a dramatic situation because he has such a distinctive and clear persona that... Um, and it's theater. theater. He's theater. Yes, he brings with him uh, a, whole, a whole dramatic situation. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, that's right in the pocket. What makes him probably one of the best singers, first of all, he's still got pipes. Uh, when you have a voice that is able to maintain itself over all these years, it lowers down, you know, you, you start to lose the top, but he's gained another four or five notes down below and he utilizes it well. I mean, he knows when to hit it hard, when to let the band cook. He, he knows instinctively. I think it's a song worth doing. How do you keep the music playing? How do you make it laugh? Well, his phrasing and his voice all has uh, is mixed in together, you know. But it's just Frank, you know, he's got that uh, deliverance and got that style, you know. And you can tell he's singing from anybody, any in, in, in the world. And that ain't not then I suppose the music never ends. Well, uh, Frank has a, a personality, a character that one can write, uh, so to speak, a custom-made suit for his particular character. My second question, Joe. What? Tony, in between those New York sessions on April 14th, Frank did a concert at the Spectrum that I went to. It was a great concert. He never mentioned the album. And the only song that he did was how to keep the music playing because he had been doing that in concert for some time. I had known about this Bob Florence arrangement, but I had always heard from Terry Woodson and Quincy that Bob Florence did a great arrangement. So it's really glad that we found it and we were able to put it out. It's a CD bonus on the album and I hope the audience and the fans like it. Somebody said once that he has that heat and outside of even his talent, there's a heat, you know, that just goes with his persona, you know. And I, I guess part of that persona is about uh, an unpredictable aura that he brings. You never know what's going to happen next, musically or personally, with uh, uh, a performer like Sinatra. There are a few people that what has been around in a lifetime that generates that kind of heat, and certainly he's one of them. Yeah. And I think that's what you feel. Yeah, and also that there are these legendary jazz musicians are part of his history. So it's, um, you know, well, uh, it's like picking up chapters of a book and they're all back together again in, in a new chapter. I just said that every, everything, if you wait long enough, it all comes in full circle. <laughs> 
This is the bubble right here. I thought it was going to go up. <laughs> you know, it's like us and I started in the same room, 1954. And we went back and found pictures in the same studio of him uh, recording in that same booth that he was in at that time. That must have been 40 years before. And the same podium I was uh, uh, conducting from, Axel Stordahl was there in the picture we found, and with Sinatra talking to him in exactly the same position, with Mitch Miller leaning over the front of the, of the, uh, of the podium. <laughs> Don't save your kisses, just pass them around. That's it. Great, great, great. I knew I was bagging something behind me. Oh, incredible. Incredible. Can I have a copy of this? Thank you, man. That's incredible. Paul Whiteman, payroll. 1930? 1930. <laughs> Jeez, I was doing better than that. Crosby got a buck and a half. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Three brown one there. <laughs> <laughs> Three dollars. <laughs> Shoot. That's great. There are very few artists who have spanned uh, generations and trends and uh, fashions in music the way Sinatra has, uh, and I, it's no accident. Quincy and Lionel Hampton talk about Sinatra, the singer, and then we'll hear Teach Me Tonight, with new lyrics by Sammy Kahn and a wonderful arrangement by Tori it, Zito. Well, I thought we'd back up uh, this with the, the A-side, uh, L.A.'s My Lady, and put this on the back of it. Mm -hmm. Great, right? great. And then the next one you drop out with the uh, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, because that's going to be dangerous. <laughs> really dangerous. That radio's going to... Stop that, man. Stop it, man. We are still at a stage where pop, American pop music is still considered a kind of a frivolous way to get from day to day. But it's the music of the time. And uh, we still have to remember that uh, all of the great classical musicians, Mozart, uh, uh, Bach, they, they all were the popular music of their times. The ones that weren't, we didn't even hear about. <laughs> Help me solve the mystery. Oh yeah, well Frank is a is a swing singer outside of being he came to the area where we had love ballads and, and swing it all mixed up together and it was strong force. It really, it really hasn't been captured yet by the, the new breeds, as they call them. None of us got that feeling that when you're saying it moves you, it makes you, it twinkles you, make you pat your feet. You get all happy inside. That's what Frank does when you're saying it. Um, <laughs> Like musicians, they say it's in the pocket, you know, and Frank always sings in the pocket. When he sang uh, Teach Me Tonight on this uh, record that night, every musician just perked up like they, they were, their hair was on the end. Lionel Hampton, the Bergmans, and Frank Foster discuss Quincy Jones, and then we'll hear If I Should Lose You. <laughs> a young kid came back and uh, asked me did I, was I interested in, in some arrangements? And I told him, sure, you know. And uh, so he waited around for a couple of shows. That's when, I, when we was doing four or five shows a day in the theater houses. And uh, so I called him by the lap the second show. And uh, I said, uh, well, I tell you, you come tomorrow morning and we'll have a rehearsal and we'll try your raving out. I played with Hell I Don't Have to when I was, I think, 18 years old, uh, about 1951, 52, and 53. And, uh, his band um, was always attractive uh, to play in as an instrumentalist, especially young, because it was like a, a college. Mr. Jones could play a lot of trumpet. A lot of people didn't realize that he was, he was a great inventor on the trumpet.
Quincy is a remarkable fellow. Uh, besides the great talent that he has, uh, both as a musician and as a human being, um, he has a, an, an, a way of keeping abreast of everything that's going on, not only musically, but in the world. He has that wonderful quality of making wherever he is, the environment, one of love. So he gets a great deal of accomplished by the people around him. Let me hear it. What's wrong with that? That sounds great, man. Cross it out. <laughs> Cross it out and put that down, Fabs. You walk into any session and people are having a good time. They're working, but they're having a good time and they feel for each other. They know it, yeah. Fading the sound of rain. Yeah, everybody. We're straight. You want to be fine. Beautiful. I know nobody else around like Q who's that broad in their scope. I mean, he started out in jazz and he ends up uh, enriching the world of pop music. Here's Quincy, Michael Jackson, Lionel Hampton, and the Bergmans, and Frank, the Stormy Weather. Before we left to go make this recording in, uh, in New York, Michael Jackson says, I'm gonna be there. Because he had been dying to get together to see Sinatra in action on a recording session. I just got here. I'm, I'm glad, glad man. The airport. Yeah. You're just in time, too, Snowy. I wanted very much to come to this session, because I feel it was a moment um, that I didn't want to miss. I mean, I get the chance to run into him again. So I took advantage of it. Just thinking that I'd meet him now, it's like a dream come true. It was astounding to see the two of them together because the real landmarks, I think, and real pop phenomena uh, starts with Sinatra. And every it's a 10 year phenomenon. So it's a be Sinatra and then Elvis Presley in the 50s and the Beatles in the 60s. Uh, the, the 70s, I think it was Star Wars, so that one was skipped. And in the 80s, it was Michael Jackson. Uh, and to see the there's no more Presley and the, there's no more Beatles now. And so to see the beginning and the end so far, of those two people together was just it gave me goosebumps. He was a lot of fun, you know, he wanted to play the vibes. He came on. I said, if you let me out do that spin you do, I'll let you play the vibes. <laughs> and to see Lionel Hampton and Michael Jackson and Frank Sinatra in the same studio was really, you know, that pulls it all together. You know, uh, I was just the cool in front, but it's so nice and quiet, I ought to do it and knock the blow like I did it. Yeah, the few bars in front. Got sure. I got a call late one night where he said, Q, I've been listening to, uh, stormy weather and i think it's one step too high and i'd like you to transpose the band down one step and we'll re re redo it in los angeles yeah, keep, the shuffle, keep the shuffle just to keep cooking but bring down the volume you know and you're, you're up at, at the 46 of the key chain and we came back to work and hit the studio and he redid really that song in the right key and he was right uh, when one talks about the Sinatra style, or like Sinatra, it evokes a million things. I mean, all the album covers go click, 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 click by in your mind, and you see the guy with the slouch hat standing under the lamppost with a cigarette. And uh, If you think of a, a category of song, for instance, if you said a saloon song, you would think of, of uh, Sinatra immediately. There weren't That's that many singers, I think, that evoke a time, a place, a mood, a feeling. Uh, 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 with the uh, elegance and the clarity that he does. Tony, you interviewed Frank in uh, 1984. He was working in Washington on the, the second Reagan inaugural. You discuss L.A. is my lady with him, but tell us about that interview, how you got it. When he came to do the inaugural, he only granted two interviews, one to Larry King and the other myself. I really, at the same time, he was doing a, a promotional program for Mrs. Reagan, um, foster grandparent program that he did and he cut a song with Don Costa's daughter Nikki to love a child to love a child uh, and so we promote I was promoting it pretty heavily on the radio and that was that was basically the way that that I got got into the interview it is a very special time I'm so glad you had given me that years ago and I'm so glad that I kept it I had it on cassette and we just digitized it I'll play a little for the audience but he was very receptive to your questions yeah. He was, and, and I think that because every time, just as you did, 
when I was with him, I treated it like a history lesson. Right? He wanted to hear as much about his, his life and his career and, and people that he's worked with. And sometimes that can be a little irritating if you just keep firing questions. But, uh, you know, he was, he was very receptive. In all the interviews he did and times he appeared on the show, he was extremely accommodating. Just a great time, and you did a great interview with him, and we're going to play a little of that now. Tony Renault was a man who was ever the friend of radio and WML, Mr. Frank Sinatra. Was there a project that must have been a sheer delight for you was the album that you recently recorded with Quincy Jones and a whole gang of all-stars, the uh, album L.A. is My Lady. <clears throat> I have worked with uh, a lot of orchestras, Tony, you know, because you know the library so well. But uh, I have never witnessed, I never had the pleasure of being in a room with as many stars who were sitting in that orchestra that day. I was, poor, I mean, I was just, uh, it knocked me out to, 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 to uh, go walk around and, and, uh, and uh, talk to, the, to a lot of the men. And then uh, particularly to see uh, George Benson, who said to me, I came from a vocal lesson. I said, I came to hear what you do with the instrument, too. But he also sings pretty good, too. He's marvelous. And uh, uh, the orchestrations were fabulous. They were just fabulous. And uh, I, I just hope the people who, 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 who bothered to buy it enjoy it. I think it's a pretty good album. Well, there's a tremendous balance on it, from the beautiful the Bergman tune, the uh, how do you keep the music playing, mm -hmm. to a couple of bounces like After You're Gone and the new and the Mac the Knife. And uh, how did the selection of material for you to record come about? What we did, Tony, was that uh, uh, there was no way I could find anything new or have anybody write anything new. So what we did was we discussed, uh, Quincy and I discussed uh, the possibility of doing songs that I had never done before, or in most cases in the album, songs that I did before that might have been ballads, and then to do them in, in jazz, or, or the case of Mac the Knife, which I'd never sung. Not even on the stage. I had never, I had never sung a song before, and a couple of others I'd never sung. After you're gone, I think, and a couple of others, so that we we didn't want to touch on too many things that I have done maybe once or twice before. But it, I don't think it would have mattered anyway because the orchestrations, the charts were so exciting that they they, they suddenly were flying a different flag. Mr. S, uh, I know that. Uh, with uh, with your busy schedule, it's evident that you enjoy work more than ever, and that there seems to be no let up on your concert appearances. Plans to record again soon? Yeah, I plan. I'd like to record again, and uh, uh, I think if uh, when, if and when we do, I think I will probably pursue what we just did, do an album, another one like that, and go and and dig deep and get songs that maybe. Uh, are quite old songs that, that I've forgotten, and maybe uh, certainly songs that the, that the kids today would never have heard. And maybe we can we can uh, address them, give them a new kind of a, a, a gown to wear when we do them. And uh, I've got some proposed meetings with uh, with Quincy, and we'll go over some uh, a whole list of songs. I think we'll probably pick about 50 songs and come up with the 10 best we like, you know, or more than 50. Well, Francis, if I may leave you with a saying that you leave us with each and every week, that uh, we wish you and your family lots of sweet dreams and hugging and kissing and everything that you wish for yourselves in 85. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us at WNIL. It was my pleasure, Tony, and it wasn't taking any time. It was uh, It's a joy. And uh, if we come into town uh, any time in the future, we'll do it again. And my best to your listeners, and I thank them for that. They're, they're standing up for me and, and, uh, and uh, you know, just being friends. The Bergmans, Quincy, Frank Foster, Phil Ramone, and Lionel Hampton discuss Frank, Mac the Knife, and the album. If you were to think about uh, the literature of popular music without people like, uh, like Sinatra, like Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire, like Judy Garland, for whom so much of the great pop, so, so many of the great pop songs were written, Without them, I don't think the songs would exist because, um, as we said before, that, that uh, musical character that he has, that persona that inspires a certain kind of writing, I think would not exist if he did not exist. <laughs> And he keeps it. 
Frank Sinatra is the American pop singer. He's the, the, the uh, essence of what American pop singing is all about. He relates to a melody just like a, a very uh, stylized uh, jazz musician does, with the way they deal with the melody and turn it and curve it and really make it their own. When you're in the pocket, you're right in the groove that's, that's necessary for that tune, just like Mac the Knife. Du, du, de, du, 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 de, du. That's right in the pocket. If it were any faster or any slower, it would be out of the pocket. This album, Tony, has wonderful liner notes by the great Stan Cornyn. Nobody wrote better liner notes for Frank Sinatra than Stan. He, he won a bunch of Grammys. Not just for Frank, but for he was like the in-house writer and creative guy during those Warner music years. Did you know Stan at all? I did. I did. He was a wordsmith. He was. He was it was unreal what he come up with. Just the, the spur of the moment, the way he described settings and what have you. Yeah, he he would capture it that when you would read the notes, it transported you like yeah. you were there. You actually felt like you were there. I'd be remiss, Tony, if I didn't thank Quincy Jones. He's always been more than gracious with his time, knowledge, and memories on any project we've done at FSC. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you as my co-host. You've been a great friend. We've known each other for 40 years. I appreciate you're always available to help us out discussing our favorite Sinatra albums when we do these shows. And again, I like having you here because you're not just a talking head. You were a witness. You were there. And there's not many of us left, no. uh, unfortunately, that are around from those days. It seems like another lifetime ago, doesn't it? It, it sure does. It sure, it surely does. But it's it's always a great pleasure, Charlie, hanging out with you. And as I said, even after 40 years, I'm, I learn something every time I get with you because I was not aware of the Lena Horn deal. Yeah. Well, the feeling is mutual because... Uh, as I said, we've known each other for 40 years. We've always been uh, friends from the beginning. Yep, incredible.